White Rabbit Podcast. The Lima Broadcast, a podcast dedicated to discussions on life from those who accept the law of Thelema. I'm your podcast host today, Keith Reddy, and joining me I have internationally known artist, author, and speaker, J. Daniel Gunther. Welcome, Daniel. Thank you, Keith. Do what thou wilt should be the whole of the law. Love is the law, love under will. Today we're going to discuss another uh, upcoming book of yours coming out, um, that called Opus Alchemicum. Mm -hmm. It was uh, penned in the late 1970s and early 80s. Its writing style and artwork are presented in an alchemical manner with a a Gnostic flair. Mm -hmm. Its title, Opus Alchemicum, means alchemical work or the work of alchemy. Alchemy is an ancient subject that was guarded well by alchemists by means of complex coded artwork and writing. Overall, it's considered to represent a mystical experience perceived through the medium of nature. This shroud of secrecy, however, necessary to the climate of the day in which it was written, poses a challenge to the reader in deciphering the message of Opus Alchemicum. It's our intent today to discuss some of the subtle and bold impressions of this opus. Very well. All right, so um, as I mentioned just a moment ago, uh, Opus Alchemicum is now heading towards its second uh, edition, its second printing. Right. Uh, The first one, the first one was uh, uh, beautifully made, a large... um, uh, large dimensions, uh, and it had a red cover. This one uh, has got a white cover. Mm-hmm. What's the significance of the color contrast here? Well, it corresponds to uh, a trifold color scheme that is uh, that occurs in alchemy, but it also occurs in uh, the symbolism of the order of AA as well. Uh, the first edition of Opus Alchemicum was red because it was uh, paying, uh, paying tribute, as it were, to the rubedo, or the red characteristic of the work, the third stage, which in, in, in the symbolism of AA corresponds to the third order. Uh, the white one, uh, we're paying homage to uh, the albedo stage, or the whitening stage of the work, which is the second. And in the symbolism of the AA, it corresponds to the second or inner order. And uh, this book... Uh, the second edition is also a, a little bit smaller in size. This one is nine inches by twelve inches, uh, but it also comes with. Uh, it's bound in white and it's bound. It has a white slip case, and they're both stamped in gold. But that's it. They course this one corresponds to the Albedo, or the second order of the AA, if you will. Uh, and uh, if we get to a, a third uh, edition, uh, say at some time in the future, it will be black. Symbolize the negrade or blackening. Right. Okay. Wonderful. I was going to take a stab at it and say maybe uh, had something to do with the white queen and the red king or something like that. Or uh... well, those uh, those symbolisms, uh, you know, the color symbolism of alchemy, we see it reflected in a variety of ways. Not only are the stages of the work take on colors, but we see the reflection of the colors often in the uh, the participants, if you will, the mystical participants or the uh, items utilized inside the work of alchemy. So there is a, there is certainly a parallel to that, mm-hmm. because the red king can also be the black king, right? Uh, depending on the stage of, of process, right, right. Which we'll uh, get to um, when we kind of talk about the first plate here. Mm-hmm. But um, before we do that, before we get to some of the actual material. Um, in the first edition of Opus Alchemicum, in both the foreword uh, written by Robert Barati and the afterword mm-hmm. written by Stephen J. King, um, they talk about how the experiences uh, that led to the creation of this work uh, signified um, a rather turbulent or uneasy period uh, in the um, in the artist and author's life. Would you? care to say a little bit about what was kind of going on at the time that kind of produced Um, this work right i it 
it followed uh, the time, the very turbulent period, the emotional upsetting period of time, uh, after I had left my instructor in the AA, Marcelo Moto, as most people know by now, uh, he suffered a, a serious mental breakdown. And uh, we had been uh, working together for a while, and the, uh, the condition, his mental state got so to the point to where I just had to leave. I couldn't, I couldn't do it anymore. Uh, there was really no point. And of course, his downward spiral ended with, uh, uh, it ended very badly, you know, and, uh, but leaving, uh, leaving him, departing and going my separate way and being silent for some time, uh, it caused an enormous amount of emotional upset in me, as you, as you may imagine. I mean, uh, and uh, it was after that I had left uh, that, uh, and I was all by myself, that one night I had an extremely numinous dream, it, and it, was, it compelled me to try to draw what I had seen. And that was the beginning of Opus Alchemicum. I began to have a series of numinous dreams. And uh, early on, very early on, by the second one, by the time I had the second dream and had drawn the images of it, I found myself staring at, at the image I had drawn uh, one evening. And I felt something changing in me. Um, I felt myself beginning to heal. and. The image I was looking at uh, had a, a very Mandel-like uh, image involved with it. And I, uh, so I noticed something was going on, and it, was, it wasn't just in my imagination. It was something was really beginning to change in me. It was beginning to, to find balance. And I realized what was going on, of course, was, uh, you know, I was emotionally upset. Uh, I needed internal balance. I needed quiet. Uh, I needed resolution and I needed healing because I had been, uh, you know, wounded by this event. And so I began keeping uh, scrap paper and colored pencils and colored pens beside my bed. And whenever one of these, I would have one of these dreams with these vivid alchemical images, I would do a rough sketch. And then sometimes later I would do a secondary rough sketch. The secondary rough sketches, by the way, are the ones that wound up in Opus Alchemicum. Um, I fully intended it, you know, in the field. Well, when I finished all that, I thought, you know, I'll go back and repaint all these really nice, you know, and, but I found out I couldn't. Um, uh, I had exhausted the prana of the images, mm -hmm. if you will. Yeah. Um, and it was just like I couldn't, there was no point in going back anymore. They had, they had done duty, uh, for me. And so I just put them away in, uh, in the notebook, which I would have been drawing them in and left them for many, many, many years. But that's what happened. It was, a, it was an emotional upset that, that brought about uh, dreams trying to achieve balance of the psyche. It's interesting to see how um, certain experiences, whether they're positive, in this case negative, just uh, forced something mm -hmm. out of the psyche to, uh, you know, be a healing factor and, 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 to, and to show what it actually has produced at this point. And, um, right. It was the unconscious is the unconscious is capable of doing that. Yeah. I mean, that's where it comes from. <laughs> yeah, and um, it had a message, um, and that's part of what my next question is here. There's a mm -hmm. speaker in Opus Alchemicum. Uh, right. Eugnostus the Blessed. Who, right. Who is that? Well, Eugnostus the Blessed is a in Jungian terms is a a symbol of the self, uppercase S self. Uh, not the holy guardian angel, let's not get that confused, uh, but a symbol of the self, uh, the personification of the ego-making faculty of the psyche, the center of our, uh, of our psyche. Um, and it didn't manifest as the images appeared. Uh, after they appeared, all of them, I, I had sat down with the images in front of me and I, I had a blank paper and it, basically it just came out. Um, and it corresponds in, in, in great, a great deal to uh, Jung's account when he uh, compiled the Red Book, for example. 
he had uh, been in communication with the figure of the self that he identified by the name Philemon. And Philemon's very much like Eunostos the Blessed. I mean, they have the, the same, their same characteristics. They come out of the unconscious, and it's a, it's a personification of self, which is beyond our, our personal unconscious. But as I said, it's not the holy guardian angel, but much like what the, the Golden Dawn would have called the higher divine self or the higher divine genius, that sort of thing. The, the Agawites, are, so to speak. Yes, exactly. Except uh, we tend to use the word, we'll tend to use the word Agawites as a synonym for the holy guardian angel. Um, but the Golden Dawn typically viewed these things as, as a, an aspect of ourself, our higher divine self, our higher divine genius. And that's pretty right. much, that's a fair definition of what the self really is. Uh, anyway, it's transpersonal. It's not personal. It's not something you just make up. Uh, but it's a constellation, you know, in consciousness of, uh, of the self and a, a really a central part of our psyche. And actually, I had seen the name prior to writing it down. Uh, his name occurs in, uh, in uh, the Nag Hammadi Gospels or the Nag Hammadi text. Um, I had not, I had, I'm sure I had read it, so no, no doubt the name was in my personal unconscious. I had completely forgotten it. And much later, after, you know, Opus Alchemicum was uh, put together as drawings and text and the whole thing, I happened to read Nagamani text again, and voila, there was one of the Gnostic texts that had been penned by a person called Eunostos the Blessed. And uh, so... Clearly, it was in my uh, personal unconscious. Uh, why it took that particular form uh, and that name, I'm not really quite sure, except that uh, the name means uh, the one who knows, the knowing one, the blessed one who knows. And I, for me, I couldn't think of a better term uh, for the self, uh, you know, than that. And the writing of Eunostos the Blessed in Opus Alchemica occurred spontaneously, and I just wrote them down as they poured out of out of me through the imago of the self. Hmm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. um, I do have a, f a few questions um, about some of the material itself, so if we right. can get on to some of that. Sure. Um, I'd like to ask a few questions about what's happening throughout the alchemical experience uh, that's expressed in what we know in alchemy as the union of opposites, mm -hmm. also what we know as the heros gamos, right. or the holy marriage. Uh, the genesis of what is depicted in the first plate of the artwork uh, and then succeeded, uh, succeeded by an, uh, an elaborate sequence of transmutations mm -hmm. uh, to its ultimate fulfillment in the final piece that's uh, in this final piece wasn't in the first edition. It's added in the second edition right. um, called the Heros Gamos. But um, for those listeners who are familiar with your work, The Angel in the Abyss, this uh, has actually uh, appeared already in the frontispiece of Angel in the Abyss. Right. Um, so if we go to uh, the second plate, mm -hmm. um, we have some very familiar esoteric imagery uh, for the student of alchemy, um, INRI, which uh, represents the heart of the matter, uh, that being the, the, the prima materia, right. um, which receives in the plate, it receives the grace called Domum Spiritus Sancti that renews its, its fourfold world. Mm -hmm. uh, can you elaborate a little bit on this key? Well, the, the whole of Opus Alchemicum has a reflection uh, in Christian mysticism. And that's natural because I was raised in a, a Christian household. My father was a Christian minister. And so this was part of, this whole process was part of my coming to terms with the Christianity of my early childhood, reconciling that with the lame of trying to achieve a balance and so forth. So in order to do that for any of us, you have to confront those things. And you have to confront those and deal with those and you just can't push them off in a corner. You have to deal with it. Um, and of course in this image, the first thing you notice perhaps is 
you know, is a cross, and there is a son crucified on the cross, and above it uh, is a Latin phrase whose initials are I-N-R-I. And, uh, of course, we know from the Christian myth that uh, Jesus was supposed to have been crucified with a, a placard over his head, which uh, it, it said Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, and the initials of that phrase was I-N-R-I. But in this particular phrase, the alchemical phrase, uh, the letters stand for igne natura renovata integra. The whole of nature is renewed by fire. And three arms of the cross are assigned to three elements, uh, fire, air, and water. And there's a Hebrew phrase across the top, which identifies uh, all of these elements by Hebrew names, but they also form the initials of the name Adam. And in the New Testament mythology, uh, we, we learn about uh, the symbolism of the first Adam and the last Adam, whereas Jesus was called, Christ was called the, the last Adam. Um, uh, but in this case, you see the cross is embedded in a skull, which uh, again, echoes some of the Christian symbolism because that skull signifies Golgotha, the place of the skull, the place of the crucifixion of Jesus. But in this case, the skull and crossbones in, in alchemy is a symbol of the prima materia, the first matter. And it's identified here with the emblem of earth, and it does have the name Golgotha. But you see coming out of uh, the top of the skull is, is showing corn growing. And the reason it's growing, of course, it's fed by the blood of the, of the crucified son in the center. And the blood itself is called the gift of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and, you know, this uh, underneath of it is a, is a phrase in Latin which translates, it says, for our stone is fire created of fire and turns into fire. Its soul dwells in fire. And this is the whole, this whole image is uh, a key to the nature of the work of Opus Alchemicum, for it lays the groundwork for a description of the, of the stone of the philosophers, uh, proceeding as Adam, the first man, out of an original substance of non-existence. And then it becomes the sun, the heavenly fire, which must be crucified on the fourfold cross of the universe. Now that's all alchemical terminology. Uh, it has its archetypal symbolism, of course. We could go into that, but just like the this is in fact describing a work of alchemy, the whole book does. And it veils a lot of its symbolism in, uh, in these cryptic uh, emblems and language and so on, just like the work of the alchemists of the Middle Ages. But essentially what this whole book is, the individual themselves are identified as the lapis or stone, the uncomely stone which is rejected by the builders and they're the prima materia. That's right. They're the and, prima materia. Yeah. And the whole idea is to do, to take the, not reject that stone, but to take that stone which the builders rejected as uncomely and transform it into the cornerstone of the temple. And that is the work of alchemy as described here. And it's also the work of initiation. Right. It's um, very interesting how uh, that phrase at the bottom, mm -hmm. there's a lot of fire there. The, 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 the stone comes out of a fire right. and is made of fire right. and is renewed by fire. Right. So um, uh, you get this imagery of um, this constant um, rejuvenation by fire and this uh, constant transformation through almost a destructive phase, which I understand is... Um, uh, the first stage that we mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, the, the Negretto. Right. Right. Um, going on to figure nine. Mm -hmm. uh, let me see. Let me just get to that page. I have the book in front of me here. Mm -hmm. um, we have the uh, a depiction um with a cross and a serpent descending into uh, Tartarus. It's uh, Serpens Mercurialis. Right. Am I saying that right? Yeah, Serpens Mercurialis. Yeah, the, the Christos Mercurial Serpent. Uh, it descends into a threefold hell called Hades, Gaena, and Tartarus. Um, 
This is an alchemical symbol in central hell. Um, Tataris is uh, a, a, an alchemical symbol in, in, in the center of hell. Um, and this is all surmounted by a cross right. with a square. Mm -hmm. uh, can you explain this symbol uh, to some of the listeners? Sure. The upper part of the symbol, well, first of all, we're talking about the mercurial serpent, uh, which is identified as Hermes, uh, the savior god. In other words, the aspect of, we would identify him with, uh, uh, in tarot, with a number of emblems that we can, you know, we're all familiar with. But essentially here you start, we go back to the crucifixion with this basic emblem. At the top there is a crucifix, Three arms of which are identified, the upper arms are Yod, Hey Prima, and Hey Final. The lowest arm of the cross is assigned to Val. So this is a symbol of the Tetragrammaton, with the serpent descending down the center of the cross. And the very fact his head is above Val indicates that he himself is identified with Val, the sun, the microposopus. The cross is set inside a a uh, series of circles. The top three are yellow and the bottom, of course, is red. But those represent the four worlds of Kabbalah. Uh, the topmost one uh, has a label above it demonstrating that what we're witnessing here is an aspect of the great work, which is, is called necros, or dead, identifying with the dead. And this identifies with the Christian myth, uh, mythology where Jesus Christ is crucified and upon his, he gives up the ghost, which is, of course, ghost, geist, air, uh, noima, the spirit, and descends uh, into the three levels of hell. And uh, in, in some Christian doctrine, you will find it uh, described where Jesus descended into the netherworld, where he, uh, uh, he went into Hades and so forth and communicated with the dead there, well, and this, this accounts for the three days in the grave uh, before he supposedly rose from the dead. And here the symbolism is that the three levels of hell, the three days in hell, if you will, are identified in the threefold form of hell. The first which is Hades, the second is Gehenna, and the third is the deepest and darkest level of hell called Tateros. And the center that you're talking, you can see that each level, Hades is dark blue, Gehenna starts becoming purple, and Tartarus is black. It gets darker and darker and darker, deeper and deeper and deeper. This represents a descent into the unconscious. Mm -hmm. Now, the, at the center of Tartarus, you, the symbol that you mentioned, the cross surmounted by a square, that is the alchemical emblem of Sol Tartari, the salt of Tartarus. Uh, and it is one of the components of the secret fire. I, I mentioned that in, uh, in my first book, uh, Initiation of the Young of the Child, where I said uh, the secret fire, which transmutes the first matter or salt of the earth, is said to be composed of two substances, one of which is salt tartari, the salt of hell, and the other is sal ammoniacum, the salt of harmony. And, uh, this is one aspect of it when we first encounter Saul Tartari. To the right of this image, of course, you see in Hebrew the, the two words for one of the words is Messiah, the other is uh, serpent. And uh, we know about that. McCrowley writes about that, and I've written, written about it quite a bit the combination of the numerical equivalence of Messiah, serpent, and, uh, and all the uh, Kabbalistic symbolism that goes therein. At the bottom of this entire motif, you'll see the word descensus, uh, you know, a descending, a going down. Uh, and, uh, and so that's really what it, what it boils down to, the symbolism is the, the symbolism of the crucified Savior uh, giving up the ghost, the spirit, descending into the triple level of hell to experience the deepest and darkest matter before rising upward. And Alchemically speaking, this happens in the laboratory, in, in laboratory alchemy. Uh, it also happens in spiritual alchemy, in the, as we know, uh, when, we, when we talk about the progress of the, great, the path of the great return, how we have to descend into our deepest and darkest matter, you know, 
Uh, we can't just abide in one like Labrazati tells us. Our, my adepts stand upright, their heads above the heavens, their feet below the hills. Right. It's, uh, it can't be all um, uh, good fluffy times all the time. We got to look at we, <laughs> we got to look at the bad stuff. Um, especially and we start off as, we start off as a very impure stones, and we're trying to perfect that. Right. Stuff. Right. So, right. You can't ignore the ugly stuff in the person. Yeah, it's the only way to transform. Um, well, going continuing on with this uh, particular symbol, I have there's one interesting thing that could easily be overlooked. Um, it, you know, Gwen pointed this out to me uh, before the podcast uh, was that mm -hmm. in um, uh, serpents mercurialis, the word at the top. Um, it's actually missing uh, an R. Uh, I'll spell it out for the audience, um, where mercurialis would normally be M-E-R-C-U-R-I-A-L-I-S. It's M-E-C-U-R, so mercurialis. Um, right. it's, it's missing the R, which we know in Hebrew is uh, resh, uh, also representing the sun. Um, mm -hmm. Based on our conversations here, um, this error happened without you even noticing it till years later, I understand. Um, That's I, correct. I expect there's, mm -hmm. there's something going on to this, um, namely, it's parallel in the story of the death of Christ and when he came up to gave up, give up the ghost of the spirit, as you say. Um, in other words, the resh, which is soul, the life of the body, uh, had departed. What's your opinion on that? It's very possible. <laughs> it's, an <laughs> it's an interesting question. In the first place, yes, when I did the drawing, um, I didn't even notice. I'm usually pretty meticulous about that kind of thing. But I didn't even notice. And, and part of that's because when you're caught up in the spirit of the moment, when you're caught up in the experience, um, that kind of thing can... You know, you're really not concerned with that kind of nitpicking details. I mean, I don't mean to make it sound like they don't matter, but I was much more involved with the the image itself rather than to make sure I had spelled it. It, it just never occurred to me, quite frankly. I mean, it's just a very odd thing. And uh, it may be, it may be that unconsciously that letter was left out on purpose. Uh, it's very possible. Um it's very curious because uh, Eliphas Levi in uh, Transcendental Magic, he does a little bit of the same thing on purpose in one case where he prints an R backwards. And uh, he uh, is trying to hint at something when he did that. He was not going to come out and just blurt it out. But the, the, the fact that this happened unconsciously, I did, had no idea. I can't say for a fact that it was intentional. I mean, I certainly wasn't intentional. What I mean is I, say, I can't say for a fact that it actually means something. Uh, but it is interesting because sometimes things from the un sometimes the unconscious will speak uh, rather autonomously, trying to bring our attention to something, and we may not even notice it until and later. Very su subtle messages that yeah. Uh, yeah. we don't even pick up on until later. Right. I think we have um, time maybe to, to discuss one more, uh, sure. and that's uh, figure 12 here, mm -hmm. um, which is uh, towards the end of, of Opus Alchemicum. It's not the last plate, but um, mm -hmm. um, we have a, a depiction of a, a male figure uh, with an angelic female figure kneeling next to him mm -hmm. uh, with a double-headed serpent. Mm -hmm. um, there's a big sun uh, behind the figure with uh, mm -hmm. a triangle in the center of it. Right. Uh, can you tell me what's happening in this? Sure. I mean, this figure itself is an extension. Uh, in the first place, as we talked about earlier, this whole the, the Alchem Opus Alchemicum series depicts a process, an evolution, a development. And if you look at this figure on this plate, that one of the first things you might notice is that they're standing on a rough stone, right? Uh -huh. And 
That same stone appears in several plates of Opus Alchemicum. It's in the plate of the, the crucifixion. Uh, it's in the plate of, uh, of Adam, uh, the, the uh, psyche and uh, panoima, inside the plate called Salificatio. And that represents uh, that lapis irregularis that I was speaking about earlier. And in fact, inscribed on that stone, in this plate that you're talking about, is uh, the stone which the builders rejected has become the head of the corner, which is the goal that we were talking about earlier. Now, the double-headed serpent appears in a previous plate, which is called seraph, and it's a correspondence of the alchemical sulfur, and uh, it talks about the rising of the godhead, identifies this double-headed serpent with the Benny bird and the phoenix, uh, I am the resurrection and the life and so forth and so on. This is a kind of a culminating plate where the figure of the male represents the hero of our story, as it were, in other words, ourselves. Uh, and in his hand and feet, you will see the stigmata. So there is, he's identified with right. the crucified figure that we spoke about earlier. The blazing sun behind his head identifies a, a sympathetic uh, correspondence to Salificatio, which appears earlier solar image and uh, what's happening with this angelic figure this and she's depicted as a woman a female angel she is not kneeling to him she's rising up to embrace him and she's symbolically coming out of that stone uh, he is realizing the end of the perfection of the work and that's what she symbolizes she symbolizes that spiritual aspect of the work, which uh, is rising up to embrace him in all of its uh, capacities. In fact, but what this, this plate says, quotes uh, the Gospel of Thomas, actually. It says, when you make the two as one, and when you make the inner as the outer, and the outer is the inner, and the upper is the lower, when you put the male and the female into a single one, so that the male will not be male, and the female will not be female. Then you shall enter the kingdom. And that's what this is. This is uh, the, uh, we're seeing in symbolic form the development of the hermaphroditic initiate, the one who has combined up and down, right and left, inside and outside, male and female, uh, to become a whole figure. Hopefully, um you know, maybe we could put a couple uh, snippets or something on the um, site. Not the whole pictures, but just maybe some uh, some visuals in case people want to see what we're talking about. Sure. We can um, do, that. Um, do you have any uh, overall final comments before we close this out This on this session? Um, to listeners or to the reader of Opus Alchemicum that mm -hmm. might help them unlock... Uh, some of the messages found in this? That's a really tough question. It sounds simple, <laughs> but it really isn't. Um, you know, I never intended to publish this. Uh, it wasn't my intent. You know, it was a private working. It was part of my private record, and uh, a couple of my students had, had read it, and actually when... Uh, uh, a lot of this, some of this is explained in Gwen's new introduction. It had been so forgotten about that when Gwen and I got married and moved back into my house in Tennessee, it was found in the junk box in the garage. Uh, and she discovered and recovered it, you know, and uh, then another one of my students saw it and, and said, here, you know, we got to do something with this. And so you know, I, I went along with that, you know. Um, and one of your sons had one of the images that he liked uh, hanging up on the wall. Right? Yeah, he, had, he actually had two. Um, he had found it in the, I had all these in a bound book uh, that, uh, uh, that I had a blank uh, book. And I had traced all these rough drawings in that book. And he was probably eight years old when he saw the one image. And, you know, he really liked it. And he said, Daddy, can I? 
can I hang that in my room? And I, I said, sure. You know, and I took a razor blade and cut it out of the book and put it in a frame and hung it on his wall. He came back later and wanted another one. So I, <laughs> he had two of these images on his wall the whole time he was growing up. And that's why uh, when the images were reproduced, these images are rather yellowed compared to the others because they were exposed to sunlight in his bedroom. And uh, they're kind of special to me because they were special to him, you know. And uh, uh, he just liked them, you know. <laughs> so I, I didn't say anything to him about it. But um, what I found out, what I'm kind of trying to get back to answer your question, once the book was published, uh, especially when we uh, traveled to Australia to uh, do the initial book release and there was a, an event there and, what I saw was really quite amazing to me. I, I, I saw this work. It was actually uh, transforming others as well as me. I, I saw people having healing experiences by looking at some of these images, and that's when it really hit home to me that it's nothing to do with me. I mean, it's nothing to do with, uh, you know, I can't take any credit for that. I mean, it's because of the images are archetypal images. They came from the uh, collective unconscious, and they speak to the collective unconscious of every uh, anybody who really wants to become involved with them. It doesn't work for everybody, obviously. Uh, nothing ever does. Um, but uh, uh, certainly, we saw, you know, people. Uh, I, I saw people move to tears by working with the book, which just totally shocked me and surprised me. I had no idea. Uh, my friend Stephen King says that, you know, he felt like that, uh, you know, the work pushed itself into publication because it was a, a manifestation of the unconscious. And uh, I should also say in this new edition, it has things in it that the first edition didn't have, and that is uh, Gwen found some studies, some picture studies, again, here, there, and everywhere, all scattered all over the place. Um, and there were studies for images that did not make it into the first edition. And so they are included, as well as the rough drawing was found for the Hiros Gamos illustration, which you mentioned, uh, and how it was originally conceived. So uh, that's a little extra something. You get Gwen's new introduction plus some additional pictures in the book that the first one didn't have but uh, yeah she offers a pretty good description of the uh the plate with the green king if i'm not mistaken yeah the sick king that's one of them uh, yeah. Cabatio, Cabatio is another one right um, right and uh again that was a uh i had the i had the privilege of seeing uh someone who looked at the image of the sick king and had a genuine experience, uh, a genuine uh, psychic experience of healing. Um, and that tells me, uh, again, it's, it has nothing to do with me. Uh, it, it just that when you tap an archetypal image, the image itself is alive, it really is. If it's coming out of the collective unconscious, it's just a representation of it. And someone else can't, <coughs> pardon me, they can experience that as well. Uh, if it's a genuine representation of the collective unconscious. Well, if I can um, kind of go a little bit off of what you're saying, you know, um, my experience through studying um, this kind of literature, uh, mm -hmm. both Opus Alchemicum and uh, a lot of Crowley's works and everything, is uh, you get an initial impression and... Uh, you know, you, you experience a calling and then you continue to, you know, these things are not just a thing you, you, you study one time. You open up the book of Opus Alchemica and read it once and put it down on the shelf. It's a constant study. Mm. So these things will these things will continue to take on life more and more. And um, I guess uh, going back to the initial question is um, it's not so much of um, getting one single message out of it. It's 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 that over time it will take on a life of its own and and become part of uh, uh, the student's training, so to speak, or the student's um, experience going through their 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 own initiatory journey. Right. Well, that's how it was for me. Um, it worked that way for me, and uh, 
I didn't just make the drawings one time and forget about them. I did go back to them again and again and again, uh, up to a point. But, you know, after a time, I did put them away uh, for a long time, many, many years, in fact. And uh, But for just like you were saying, if somebody's going to be affected by something or study it seriously, Crowley, whatever it is, uh, they're not just going to read it one time. Uh, they're going to have to go back to it again and again. If it's speaking to them, it will speak to them and continue to do so and, and hopefully uh, effect transformation. That's, right. what, that's what makes it work. Right. Um, well, I appreciate um, you having a discussion with me about this. I think uh, it's we've covered some very fascinating ground. And um, uh, the, the book is, is ready for sale now or is it... It's, uh, it's getting yeah. ready. It is getting ready. It is fully published, and we have all the bound books. Uh, yeah, we're just putting together the uh, distribution network at this time, and uh, it's going to be available very, very shortly. It will be available on my website, jdanielgunther.com. Okay. And, uh, once we get a, a buy button set up and all that, uh, all that stuff to uh, make it easy to order and then easy to purchase. The listeners will find a link to this on the podcast uh, website. All right. All right, Daniel. Well, um, thank you very much. And to all our listeners, we thank you for tuning in. Until next time, love is the law, love under will. Mm -hmm.